surprise, 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 I'm starting on time. Usually I'm a few minutes scrambling at the last few minutes, but we'll start on time and as people uh, show up, I see people um, arriving. Oh, the golf cart? Tiger Woods here. Is that right? It's an impressive mobile you got going on there. Impressive mobile. Anyway, we are in First Kings, and um, uh, I apologize. Um, all right, so just uh, FYI, on occasion, so that I remember some things that I'd like to cover, I'll do it smaller here. If it's smaller, that's for me. If you, We're going to get there. We will go there. But we're not going to start there. So if you don't, if you can't see it, don't worry because I'll, I'll, when we get there, I'll, I'll make it more clear. But to start anyway, we'll start with 1 Kings um, 11. And then eventually we'll get to uh, these things as well. But uh, for now, this is where we'll start. Let's pray and we'll go into it. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together this morning as we go into your word. We pray that you open up our hearts and our minds and spirit to hear your voice speak to us through your word. Let your Holy Spirit reveal, as Jesus told his first disciples, you have much more to tell us, more than they could at the time bear. So you teach us as we are ready to be taught, and your timing is always perfect. So this we turn over to you, it is your word, and for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, chapter 11. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, anyone just off the top of your head, extra credit, remember where they came from, that, those two lineages? Lot. Yeah, Lot. Lot, if you remember after Sodom and Gomorrah, left with his two daughters into the hill country, and they both slept with their father, and out of that came the Moabites and Ammonites. The Edomites, little trivia. Anyone remember where the Edomites come from? Good, Edom, very good. Esau, yes, yeah, Jacob's uh, older brother. The Sidonians were in 1 Kings, by the way, uh, 1 Kings 11. Not, not any of that. We'll get to that. 1 Kings 11. And Hittites, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. And that word in Hebrew is Elohim. That instruction was given in Exodus chapter 34 when they first left Egypt. It was reiterated in Deuteronomy 7 verses 1 through 3. And when they went into the promised land, Joshua 23, verses 12 through 13. I say that because it wasn't just a random instruction. It was an instruction that was given to Israel when they first left Egypt. It was an instruction that was reiterated to, to Israel after the 40 days of being in the desert, which means it's another generation. So the next generation got that. Uh, if there's any, if there has been any generation that has seen the massive shift of generational mindset and uh, experience, it's your generation. 
well, probably my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother went from literally taking a horse and buggy to, to, to give birth to my mom to the internet. There's no way when she was on her way to the hospital that she could ever have imagined, hey, guess what? There's going to be a day where you're going to see, I mean, it's, it's, it's too much. Um, but, but generations are, are the shifts that, that people oftentimes experience. So in Deuteronomy 7, the next generation is given that same instruction, and Joshua is given the same instruction when they go into the promised land. Why is that? Not because they're racist, <laughs> but because of the gods that they will lure them to worship. Remember, the first four commandments um, and the covenant have everything to do with their relationship with the Lord. Do not have any other gods. Do not make an idol at all using any kind of material. Do not misuse the name and remember the Sabbath day because the Lord is the one that brought into existence all that we see. Those four are, are, are the, the foundation for the rest of the six. Now, nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Now, that's a really interesting word, an interesting phrase, because nowadays love is love. And if it's love, it can't be bad. I mean, this is the mantra. Here we see that there are certain desires and so forth that can lead astray. And in this case, the Lord is very clear. You are when, Remember when Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? He's, at, he's um, questioned. He doesn't give any of the ten. He gives the summation that Moses gives. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Now, if Solomon was to do that, he would not have intermarried and would have remained faithful and been, as king of Israel, a model for other nations to come back back to the Lord. That was Israel's purpose, to be a priest, a, na a, a nation of priests, or a priestly nation, that through you, Israel, all nations would come back to the Lord. He disinherited them in Genesis 11. The disinherit That's why the Lord says, Israel is my inheritance. I disinherited these because they went after other gods. And Israel is my inheritance. And in the New Testament, we are inheritors through Christ. So, this is a very pivotal chapter. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had seven billion wives. He may as might as well be, right? 700. Uh, of royal birth, which is political in nature, and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. This is a very interesting dynamic. Um, that, there we go. So we're going to um, continue on. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. Im Im it important to, we, we, we separate it in, in um, English. If it's not the Lord, it is lowercase. If it is the Lord, it is uppercase, and they come from one Hebrew word, which is, anyone remember? Elohim. Gosh, I need to write better. Elohim, which is, a, which is a Hebrew word that means a spiritual being, if you will. Sometimes I'll just, in, in, uh, in the interest of just keeping it 
without having to explain that, I'll say angelic beings. But that's not real accurate because an angel is just somebody who's a messenger. Um, but, but nonetheless, it, it, generally people know what I mean by that. So this is why when you see lowercase and uppercase, you will see it, uh, that, that, that's what it is referring to. So um, as the heart of David, his father had been. Verse 5, he followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David, his father, had done. He was not, in other words, faithful. Now, um, this is, I wanted to just give a, a, a review, but it's a, a pre, no, review. Um, these gods, they're not just um, little trinkets. We don't live in a pagan, obvious pagan culture um, like Israel did in terms of being surrounded by these nations. So if you would hold your spot in 1 Kings and turn with me now, please, to 2 Kings 3.26. 2 Kings 3.26. <clears throat> All right, so 2 Kings 3.26 is a, a battle that is in, 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 in being enraged. And when you get to that, it says, When the king of Moab saw that the battle had gone against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom, but they failed. Then he took his firstborn son who was to succeed him as king and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. The fury against Israel was great. They withdrew and returned to their own land. These particular gods that surround that, that were of the nation surrounding Israel practiced human sacrifice routinely, and it was Solomon that brought that practice right next to Jerusalem. Now, that's common practice of every single pagan deity. Historically, even if you look at this continent, the Aztecs were, I mean, they would drench their altars with human blood. And because that was common practice, when you read that the Lord said to Abraham, Offer your son Isaac. Abraham didn't go, oh, you would never do that. It wasn't a shock to him. You, you, you read that now and it's a shock to us. Why would the Lord even say that? Why doesn't Abraham say, no, I would never do it? Because every God did that. And it was then out of obedience to that that Abraham brought Isaac to what we later know as is Mount Moriah. And... Um, and, and, and you know the account, the angel of the Lord stopped him, said, no, I don't do that. But it was a test, if you will. But it wasn't a shock for Abraham to hear that command because every single deity requires human sacrifice. It is something that, remember what I said last week, the Lord creates, the evil decimates, destroys. Um. A little bit of review. The Lord, in creating everything, creates everything good. He does not create evil. But he has created beings, both physical, human, and spiritual, that can choose evil. And we looked at, we're not going to look at it this week, but we looked at last week, and I would invite you to take a look at that if you didn't uh, already. Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14, which gives us insight as to the spiritual being that originally rebelled against God. Later, he becomes known as the Satan or Satan, New Testament, the devil. And it was pride. But, in, but 
because of that, or given that context, Satan himself is a created being, an angelic being. He can't create anything. So in his pride, all he can do is counterfeit. Which means, because God is good and God is true, he, the, the nature of evil is parasitic. So when, so for example, I'll just give you a Good, or I'm sorry, truth does not need a lie to exist. But a lie needs truth to exist. In the monetary field, genuine money does not need counterfeit money to exist. Counterfeit money needs real money to exist. It's parasitic. Counterfeit money drains the life out of real money, if you will. Deceit drains the life out of the truth. So evil by its very nature is parasitic. There is no word of God that ever propagates worry. Worry is always propagated by evil, and as such, it is a parasite to your mind. That's why if you worry all night, you do not wake up refreshed. You're drained. And worry, because it's parasitic, is insatiable. Nobody that's worry, that worries says, you know, I've worried for a good 20 minutes. That should do it for today. I'm not done till I got every last, last bit of your attention. I've, I'm not done until you bow down and listen to what I say. That's the nature of worry. So, all this is important because before the world was created, there was already rebellion in the spiritual world. So when this world was created in Genesis 3, the serpent, taking on that form, brought that rebellion into this world. Wasn't created this way. Was created good. Was brought in this way. This world view is flat out rejected by a culture that exclusively focuses on the physical only and calls that enlightenment. So this book gives us truth that we need to live. This is the reason why Jesus refers constantly through his teaching as, I give you eternal life. It starts with my teaching because my teaching is life. The words I speak to you are not my own. It, it, let's take a look at that. Hold your place again. Go with me, please, to the Gospel of John. We're looking at chapter 14, I believe. Let me just make sure I have that correct. Yes, chapter 14. <laughs> Everybody there? All right, chapter 14. This is 
the last few chapters before Jesus is put on trial. Look at verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. Those conjunctions are not or, but and. He is all of that. He is the truth. Remember, truth doesn't need a lie to exist. He is it. And he is the life. Truth and life are inseparable. He goes on, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, there's two words in the Greek for know. There's genosko, which is book knowledge. So, um, if you're tested in high school for history, they want to know, the test does, the teacher does, that you know the information that's in that book. The other word for know is oida, it's experience. So, if you've had an experience, you oida, know, if you read it in a book, you gnosko, no. Jesus is saying, if you know me, experience, you've known the Father. He goes on then, Philip says in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. So Philip is bringing it back into the physical. We need to see. Jesus says, answers him in 9, don't you know me, here's a, that word again, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own, rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. The words, Rema, I say to you, are not my own. So what, what you begin to see happen is this dichotomy. This is the word of God. And it has, it is true, and it has life in and of itself. And there is nothing in the universe that can compare to its power. There's nothing, well, everything exists. It's the origin of everything. There's nothing ex that exists that didn't come into existence from this. It's not this and something else. So John begins to write, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now that's not foreign to Hebrew understanding when you, for example, read the account of Moses and the bush. The bush is burning, there's the angel of the Lord, and the angel speaks, and then the Lord speaks. And they're one and the same. The angel of the Lord has the name of the Lord. And the angel was with God, and the angel was God. Okay, you, get, you start to understand the meaning of the Godhead. The challenge that the Jews could not accept was that the Lord would become flesh. That's where we draw the line. No, not that. If he wants to show up as an angel, as he did to Abraham, fine. Which, by the way, is what Muslims believe about Jesus, that he was an angel. But Jesus says here, the words that I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me. 
Now, now you have it set up, the opposition between the Word of God and rebellion or deceit of the enemy. Because the enemy cannot create, but can try to use deceit to counterfeit. And he does this in Genesis 3, on all through the rest of the scriptures, but in Genesis 3. Did God really say, now, stop right there. What do you mean, did God really say? What is, what is behind that word? Doubt. Have you ever felt doubt? Doesn't it feel empowering? It weakens you. And he sows, what the enemy does is sows seed of rebellion and doubt by pretending to be authentic, an unauthentic word. Did God really say that you can't eat of any other tree. It's just a doubt. And this is how the enemy works. Which is why Solomon was instructed, don't have any other wives, because they will sow this. Every word that they say is a word of doubt. It won't be, it will, it will not be, you need to leave the Lord and walk away from the Lord. It won't be that obvious because if it's that obvious, you would flat out reject it. But it comes across in, as the Hebrew would say, in the most subtle ways. The serpent was more subtle. For example, God says not to worry about this, so I'm not. And then Solomon's wife says, yeah, we'll see. See what I mean? We'll see. Wait, I'm sorry, what did you just say? Did you say we'll see? Now, there's, it's a seed. And, and, and Jesus uses this parable in his teaching. The word of God is like a sower that goes out to seeds to sow seed. Every thought is a seed. So, well, all right. Let's go back to 1 Kings 11. So the seed of doubt has been sown. And on verse 11 of chapter, I'm sorry, verse 7, of chapter 11. We used to have 7-Elevens when I, used, when I grew up. Did they have those out here? 7-Eleven. They get good smoothies. On the hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable small letter god Elohim of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable small letter god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the Elohim or God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Let's take a look at that. Holding your spot, please go to chapter 3, verse 4. 1 Kings, chapter 3, verse 4. This is um, Solomon becoming king, and in chapter 3, verse 4, the king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar, 
At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. That word faithful is important because in English we can convolute uh, some of our words so that faith, believe, and trust is rolled into one grouping. And, and, and you can do that, but you have to be very clear what each of those words mean. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O oh Lord, my God, he owns this relationship, not just God of his father, but now Solomon's God. You have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I'm only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. <clears throat> so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. And um, then, there was a, then there was a fee. So that's the first time he appeared. The second time was in chapter 9. So just go over to chapter 9 for a moment. And verse 1 through 9. Uh, chapter 9, when Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord in the royal palace and had achieved all he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And he said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me in integrity of heart. Do you have anything other than integrity of heart? Faithfully is good. Both phrases are, are good. And uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said you shall never fail to have a man on the throne. But if you, and the Hebrew is plural, if you all, that's, that's where the, does anybody have King James anymore? King James is good because it separates those. You, you know, hear ye, hear ye, you know it's everybody. Thou is one. But anyway, verse 6, but if you all or your sons turn away from me and do not Observe the commands and decrees I have given you all and go off to serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And though this temple is now imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this distress on them. Okay, those are the two times. Now, as we go through, we're going to see... that starting with Solomon, they did not flat out reject the Lord. It was a progressive, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, permissiveness. 
So they didn't flat out reject the Lord, but they did permit the worship of other gods. And then they permitted this. And then this permitted this. And this is how the enemy subtly goes forward. Now, continuing back in 1 Kings 11. Do, 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 do. 1 Kings 11, verse 10. Well, verse 9, just to do a little review. The Lord, in verse 9, became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. In Solomon's view, he did not turn away from the Lord. Because turning away from the Lord is a very direct move. But over time, you couldn't see, he couldn't see that he turned away from the Lord. And why couldn't he see? Because his mind was filled with other thoughts and ideas that did not come from the Lord and was allowed to was allowed to not just exist, but remain. Man, that's a good word. Remain. Abide. Remember what Jesus says. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. If my words abide in you. And this is another example. Um, let's go back to something. Because I want to make this really practical. Turn, please, to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. I'm sorry, 10. Make this real practical. Uh, Paul writes, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, wait a second, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's a good thing, but I jumped the gun, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 5, that's what I want to take a look at. Just go a few pages back. 2 Corinthians is right before that. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse, let's take a look at verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. Anyone have anything other than divine? Divine, that's confusing in English because divine sounds really good. Like divine, if you're going to call something a luxurious cake, ooh, it's heavenly, it's divine. It means spiritual. So, on the contrary, they have spiritual power, divine power, to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension, good word, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So every thought, every thought, has a quality that either comes from God or comes from the enemy of God. Every single thought. Some may be innocuous in nature. Hey, where do you want to go for breakfast? Not that big of a deal. Unless um, 
you you well I don't use that as an example because it's more innocuous but um, so every th thought either comes from God or it comes from the enemy which means it's either true or it's false and so worry worry is when a thought has come into your mind and is abiding. Now you have authority to get rid of it. But that authority is by way of faith. Meaning, how do I say this? Because it goes back to Solomon and love. You can have a desire that a thought from the enemy can attach to. For example, I really, um, I really am looking forward to this. Okay. Well, well. Gosh, how do I say this? I'll give you an example. Because we were, Jim and I just had a Bible study with a young guy, and he's, he's, he's going into real estate. You know, he's a good looking dude, you know, and it's just all positive and stuff. And at that stage, you're looking at your life and you're making plans and you're, you're imagining thoughts, you're allowing thoughts to abide which allows you to pursue certain things, whether it's schooling or whatever the case may be, a relationship. But nobody ever plans on disaster happening. And so when you're planning something and all of a sudden it's taken away, disappointment comes in and alongside disappointment or riding on disappointment is the thought look what good it did for you serving God and you can't get rid of the thought because your feeling of disappointment is stuck in you And the enemy does this, we see with, with Genesis 3. When Eve saw that the fruit was good and desirous, now she's got feelings, she's got thoughts, she's got every part of her. She can't get out of it. If worry was just a thought, it would be one thing. But it's always attached to other human experiences which is the which is why James can write count it all joy everything that you go through well i don't want to count it as joy i'm entitled to my feelings i'm i'm entitled to are are, are I, aren't i entitled to my feelings of course well, okay, but your feelings cannot, can, can be feelings that the enemy hijacks to keep you in bondage. Like, for example, and this is why baptism is so important, because you give up all that when you're baptized. Um, I, if I, if I would have known, here's a, here's a thought, if I would have known then what I know now, I never would have chose that. That's regret. There's no room for regret in the kingdom because God is sovereign over all. Every mistake he will work through. And it's the enemies, it's, it's being children of Adam that gives us the false illusion that we have any control over our lives. 
and any direction over our lives. So it's an affront to us when the false belief that we're in control or directing or choosing can be in some way thwarted or taken away. How dare you take away this from me? I've served you. I <laughs> had this the other day. I was just from, from God let me go just far enough to, to, to realize so that I could get the lesson. Something was taken away and I was like, I work harder than any other Christian around. That thought didn't come from me. But it was allowed to be in me because of my feeling. This shouldn't be happening to me. I've got the gift of tongues. That thought did not come from God or me, but it was allowed to abide in me because of my feeling. Very important. We've got psychologists and so, talking about feelings, but not realizing that the feelings themselves are the fertile ground by which the word of God or the word of the enemy can be implanted. This is the parable. The word of God is like a farmer that went out to sow seed. But some seed was so filled with worry that the word of God couldn't be implanted. It just couldn't stick. Because you've trained yourself to be so attached to feelings that you cannot go get beyond them. We used to call that adolescence. So this is very important to understand as Paul is saying, I take every thought captive. Wait, that? But before you take every thought captive, you take every feeling captive. No, I'm not feeling that. But we do, but without feelings, what am I? That's who I am. Maybe you're a child of God. And everything in this world is meant to stir feelings. Just the other day, I don't know what was being advertised, but I, I just felt I needed to be on that medication because look how happy they are. All feelings. I don't care if I need the medication. They're certainly a lot happier than I am. I better get some kind of disease so I can be as happy as them. Isn't that how it works? I can go on right now on Facebook and find a whole bunch of my friends having a much better time than me because they're posting it and just look how happy they are. This is all the work of the enemy. And until you are able to take every captive thought and, and discern that, we will be subject to it. And what the Lord gives us through His Spirit is the ability to discern and reject. I'm just not even going to go there. That's a great way to say I love that phrase. I'm not going there. You can go there all you want and feel bad or sad or angry or whatever. I'm not going to go there. The, that, now, that doesn't mean that those waves won't come over you. They will. But, that does, but it means that you don't stay there, but you stay in the Word. And the one thing that God will give us, which is really a great gift, is the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which means you can't figure it out. You're not intended to figure it out. You just accept it. I trust you. And when you start to see, because your body may send you into, um, God, I remember when I was in my, <laughs> on internship. I don't know why it was that way, but I guess I had some kind of anxiety or something. And I remember walking with the, uh, 
my, the pastor I was working with and his son, we were at some mall. And I was like, I'm having a heart attack. And he just looks at me, he's like, no, you're not. But I was convinced because my body was doing something. And I'm so self-focused that it brought me right into fear. And not learning at the time how to reject that and to be in his presence, you're subject to it. So all this is in play in 1 Kings 11. He had so many wives and concubines, and they would speak from their gods into his life. And because he loved them, he could not, that's a feeling, he just let it come in. Because it feels good. So God rejects him. And um, let's just finish this off and then we'll go from there. Uh, verse 12 of Kings, 1 Kings 11. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. In other words, he's going to, Remove Solomon. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. And we'll stop there and pick it up. So God has already said, um, yeah, this is the consequence that will take place. Now, this also gives us insight that things, are take, things take place in the heavenly realms and they affect the earthly realms. We don't, what you're seeing around you doesn't originate with us. This is, this is what we're seeing is the effects, if you will, of what's taking place in the spiritual realm, either on behalf of God or on behalf of the enemy. Um, but when you have a world that has been conditioned, there is no such thing as God, good, any of that stuff. You're in the dark as to, those, as to what those forces um, are doing or the direction that they're, that they're leading. All right, I'm going to stop there. Any questions? That's a lot to think about. Hmm. Remember, evil is not a thing. It's a person. And it's parasitic in nature. And you take a look at all of our monsters and in, in folklore and stuff. Same thing. But if you find yourself um, feeling these things, fear, fear, is the, fear is the main one. If fear is if you're if you're feeling afraid, then the enemy will try to you're you're sus more susceptible to that. So proclaiming the word of God, but really seeking His wisdom as to what is actually taking place. And sometimes the Lord will let you sit with that for a while in order to learn. But it's good because it's training the end. The Lord will take what the enemy purposes for evil and use it for good. So if you're going through something and it's a struggle, in the Lord, ultimately, he will use that to give you discernment and greater strength. Have you heard the term, I'm growing in faith? That's one that we use. It means you're growing in your awareness and in the ability to discern those spiritual realities that, that we face. It's impossible to tear down strongholds if we can't recognize them for what they are. All right, very good. Thank you, Father, for your word um, and for your faithfulness to us, for your spirit and truth and kindness and for your son, who is saving us every day by your grace. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.